praise the Lord, praise the Lord, I'm Pastor Michael Jackson. Welcome to the Wednesday night, Cutting It Right, a Bible study. Once again, we are here with the Word of God, and we know that it is the Word of God that has all the power to do whatever it is that needs to be done in your life. Uh, we've been coming to you uh, last few weeks from the book of Second Peter, and we're discussing the, the mathematics, yes, the mathematics of spiritual growth. Uh, Second Peter chapter 1, uh, first few verses, they go about telling us things that we need to add to our life, things that need to be done in our lives in order to help us to become more and more uh, like Jesus. And so we have been going through these first few chapters, these first few verses, but in the process of going through these first few verses, in the process of going th uh, through these first few verses, uh, we have come upon uh, several things that we want to uh, make clear. And one of those things is we were talking about uh, faith. We were talking about faith uh, last week. And we're going we're gonna to continue down that road uh, as we try to make sense out of these first few verses of Second Peter chapter number 2. Uh, the, the, these verses are packed, packed with valuable information that we need to understand if we are going to get a handle on who we are in Christ, how we grow, how we need to grow, and what is needed in order to grow. That's all in these first 11 verses. So we're going to get into it. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to go right into it. If you are if you are listening, if you're watching rather on Facebook, why don't you just share this page with someone uh, so that someone else may also be blessed tonight. Uh, also, we are streaming live not only on Facebook, but we are also streaming live on YouTube via the Google Hangouts app. And we are also streaming live on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. That's Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, Spreaker.com. And we are streaming live there. So we're going to pray. We're going to get right into our Bible study for tonight. Have your Bibles open to Second. Peter chapter number one. We'll, we may move around a little bit, but we're going to start in Second Peter chapter number one. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again. You've allowed us to be in your presence. Lord, we pray for the next few moments, Lord, that your power, your spirit, Lord, your anointing, Lord Jesus, might rest upon your word. Lord, I pray that those who are listening, those who are watching, Lord, I pray that they also might be drawn in and touched by your word, Lord Jesus. Have your way. Give us an understanding of your word that we might not sin against you. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. So we're going to go right into 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And hey, uh, if, you are, if you are listening, if you are watching, uh, if you have a, a comment or a question, please, please feel free to add a question or add a comment and we'll do our best to, uh, to respond to Whatever it is that you have to say. After all, this is a Bible study. I don't really want it to be a one-way Bible study. You have the option to join in. You don't have to just listen. Uh, you can type in and you can tell us what it is that's on your heart, what's on your mind as we speak. All right, Second Peter chapter number 2. And we're going to start in verse number 2 where we started last week. Uh, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace, once again, this is, we established the fact that grace and peace uh, can be multiplied or added to us as we gain knowledge of the Lord. As we gain knowledge, he adds grace. He adds peace. Uh, verse number two, according as his divine power hath given unto. Anytime you see the word given, that also is talking about an addition. An addition. So when he gives us something, he is adding something to us that we may not have had, or we may not have had uh, as much as. So he he is given unto us something. He says here. He says, "I've given unto you all things through my power." He says, "I've given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness." In other words, everything that you need to live a Christian life, you will find it in His Word. Everything. We don't need to go outside of the Word of God to learn how to live the Christian life. That is not necessary. Everything we live for life and godliness we'll find here. Listen, there are actually three uh, three places where you will find uh, this uh, everything, as he says, 
that pertains to life and godliness. Number one, the word of God. You will find everything you need in the word of God. You will find everything you need via the Holy Spirit. Via the Holy Spirit. And the third place where you will find all that you need to live this Christian life is by his church. So his word, his spirit, which is his power, and also his church. Now, how does that all map out? His church. You have within the church, you have those who are gifted. Within the church, you have those who are, with those in the church who are teachers, those who are pastors, those who are leaders, and those are the people that God has set up, that has put, that he has put in place to help you to grow. Yes, the job of a pastor is to lead the congregation. The job of a pastor is to watch over a congregation. Another job of the pastor is to teach the congregation and to infiltrate, rather not infiltrate, but to make sure that those who are not teaching proper doctrine, that they don't filter in. That is part of the job of a pastor, to watch over the sheep, to watch over the doctrine. And it is doubly important that the pastor makes sure that he teaches the right doctrine himself. So the pastor cannot get caught up and carried away with all sorts of uh, winds of doctrine. We need not be carried about by every wind of doctrine. We must make sure that we stay true to the gospel. The gospel. And we must make sure that we keep the gospel as it is. And not add anything to it. Not subtract anything from it. When we do this, we are perverting the gospel. And we do not want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So, his word, his spirit, life and godliness. It's all about him. He says, once again, this happens through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge. Once again, becoming more acquainted with him. And when every time we say the word knowledge, and we've said it twice already in verse number two and verse number three, when we talk about knowledge, don't get it twisted that we're talking simply about mind. Learning more facts about God. Learning more facts about Jesus. Learning more facts about biblical things. No, that is not what is necessarily meant by the knowledge of. Yes, you're going to learn things about the Lord. But once again, learning about the Lord, it's a spiritual endeavor. These things are spiritually discerned. The word of God, the word of God is spiritually discerned. In other words, the unsafe person cannot, will not, does not understand what is written in the word of God. It is not a spiritual possibility. They cannot understand it. They are spiritually understood or discerned. So we must make sure, first of all, when we come to the word, when we come to the word of God, we must make sure that we know the God of scripture. Now, once again, you get caught up. You, you, you can get caught up in the fact that I've been asked. To, I've been asked this question many times before. Well, is it okay if uh, if an unsaved person goes to a Bible study? Or I've been asked the question before: Can an unsaved person? Can I bring my friend with me to a Bible study? Sure, sure, sure. You 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 have to. It's no problem in bringing them with you to a Bible study. You can even say that's a part of evangelism. Okay, it is exposing them exposing the unsafe person to the word of God. And by exposing them to the word of God, they can now become spiritually aware. Spiritually aware, spiritually enlightened about biblical things. Doesn't mean they have gotten saved. It doesn't mean that they will necessarily get saved anytime soon. But you have left it on the table. You have shown them that there is a way. You have shown them Jesus so when they come and an unsafe, uh, unsafe person comes and sits in a Bible study, you should be praying. <laughs> you should be, Lord, touch my friend. Touch my friend. Bless my friend. Lord, open up their eyes. Help them to see you during this Bible study. So let something be said. Let something be spoken that will touch their heart. This can happen. So it is fine for an unsaved person to attend a Bible study, but it must not stop there. The unsaved person must not think that just because they attend a Bible study, it is equal to becoming a Christian. It's not. 
once again, you have just come to the door. You have just you have just heard the word, but now you need to, as we have said many times before, now you need to step into the door, and now you need to become saved. If you have become convinced, if the Spirit of God has brought conviction to your heart, now you need to enter in to the life in Christ. Asking for forgiveness, repenting, that's how it's done. Amen? So, so we must make sure that we learn more about him as Christians. We must learn more about, them, about him, but his word goes into our hearts. The Bible says, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Okay, the word of God in our lives and our hearts is a safeguard against sin. I do not, all right, for the life of me, if I may use that expression, for the life of me, I do not truly understand a Christian who does not involve themselves in Bible study of some sort. And I should not even say of some sort. You just can't go to any Bible study because everything that's being taught is not biblical. Really. So I, I don't understand a, a Christian who doesn't want to be in a Bible study, who doesn't want to know more about the God that they serve. This this doesn't this doesn't equate. It, it, it doesn't go together. So Lord, even if you if you're there, if you're listening, if you're watching and you and you really don't have a a love for the Bible or a love for scripture to learn to know more then you need to pray, Lord, Lord, open up my eyes. Lord, help me to see. I've been saved for such a long time and I don't know A, B, or C about the Word of God. You can know. You don't have to be, You listen, you don't have to be a Bible scholar. No, no one asks you to be a Bible scholar, but you need to arm yourself with Scripture. Arm yourself with Scripture. The Bible has so much to say to you concerning you, concerning your God, you need to know what Scripture is all about. So involve yourself in the Bible study. Hopefully, as we come to you these these Wednesday nights, that we can sort of whet your appetite to to become more uh, to more become more alive when it comes to learning the Word of God. Okay, Second Peter chapter number one and verse number four, whereby are given unto us, once again, the give. So twice we've heard the knowledge of, and now twice we've heard giving. Once again, the giving, God, when God gives us something, he is adding something to us. The mathematics of spiritual growth. Whereby are given us, given unto us, exceeding great and precious promises. So he says there are many, great means many of them. These promises are many, and these promises are precious. The word of God contains promises. The promises are to you. The promises are to me. It is God saying that he will do this when we do this. And sometimes he says he will do this even if we don't do this. But they are great and precious promises. These promises are given so that we might be, in verse number four, partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. Nature. Now we said we 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 already established uh, last time that there are three natures that man has. There is the human nature, there is the sin nature, and there is the divine nature. The sin nature, the human nature, and the divine nature. The sin nature is what you are born with. You are born with a sin nature. Left to yourself, you will sin. Left to yourself, you will you will sin against God. You it's automatic. It will happen. It will happen. Uh, your human nature is who you are. Your human nature is are, are your characteristics. It, it's 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 the person that you are. It, it's how you behave. It's how you respond. It, it, it's 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 the you. It's the you that no one knows. It's the you that people see. It's your human nature. When something happens, you respond. You respond. Some people, the, the human nature must not, we must not begin to say that the human nature is equated with the God nature. No, no. The human nature is not equated with the divine nature, rather. 
the human nature, that's not what it is. Your human nature is you. It's your flesh. Once again, I didn't call it sinful necessarily, but it is who you are. And sometimes who you are will respond in a sinful way. And then the sin nature, once again, is the sin thing, the sinful things that you do. The sin nature is basically, a, a way to put it, is, 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 is a factory. It is an invisible factory inside of you that pumps out sin. It's what creates, it's what makes you into a sinner. You are a sinner, you have a sin nature. And all the sin nature does is promote sinfulness. You will do sinful things because your sin nature is there. And your sin nature will never go away. Ah, except when the divine nature, when we become partakers of the divine nature, then and only then will your sin nature be subdued. Will your sin nature be brought under control? But that's when the divine nature comes in. That's when you become born again, saved. Amen. So that's when that happens. Now, it goes on to say that we have, in verse number four, that we have escaped the, corrupt, the corruption that is in the world because of lust. We've escaped the corruption that is in the world. This is what happens when an individual becomes saved, born again, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Second uh, Peter also talks about the fact that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That spiritual transaction that's, that takes place when we are born again. We escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse number five, Second Peter chapter one, verse number five. And beside this, giving all diligence, he says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And we got we, we, we got bogged down right there last week. Not really bogged down, but we decided to spend a few minutes there. And we're going to spend some more time right there in verse number five. Once again, going over this thing called faith. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Now notice that all of the different things, it's these seven things that we said last time, these seven things that he says to add uh, to your life. Uh, he says, to add virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and love and all, all, all these things you need to add. But before you get there, he's saying add to your faith. He didn't say add faith. He says add to your faith. So he is already under the impression, he has come to the conclusion already that you have your faith in place. Your faith must already be in place. Two ways to look at this word faith. Faith, talking about the whole body of Christianity. Okay? Talking about the whole body of Christianity. You must be, before you endeavor to do anything in this chapter, you must first be of the faith. You must be saved. You cannot live a Christian life without faith. It's not a possibility. Okay? So we must have faith. How did you get saved? You got saved by putting faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the secret. If I can call it a secret. It's not really a secret. But that is the secret of living the Christian life. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You say, well, that sounds so simple. That sounds so simple to do. It sounds simple to do. It sounds simple to do. It's how you got saved. And it's how your salvation remains where it needs to be. By continuing to place your faith in Jesus. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we all have done it. We all many times still do it. We put our faith in other things. Okay? Once again, he's making the statement, add to your faith. That's good. But your faith is only as good. Your faith is only as good as the object that it is placed in. I'm going to repeat that. Your faith is only as good as the object that it is placed in. If you put your faith in things, it's not going to work. If you put your faith in activities, it's not going to work. 
If you put your faith in people, it's not going to work. We must not put our faith in anything, anyone, except Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who has blessed us. It is Jesus Christ who died on the cross. It is Jesus Christ. That's where our faith belongs. Completely, totally. And when we do that, then we will see the Lord begin to work in our hearts. And then we will see the Lord beginning to work in our lives. Now listen. As good as fasting is, as good as fasting may be, even if the Lord has called you to do a fast, wonderful, good. But make sure as you fast, make sure that you don't put your faith in your fast. You understand what I'm saying? Don't put faith in the fact that you are fasting. And expect God to reward you on the merit of the fact that you fasted for whatever how many days. He owes me this because I fasted for 21 days. I fasted for 10 days. I fasted for 40 days. So now he owes me. I sacrificed. I gave up something. So he now owes me this because I did this. No, that's not how it goes. That is not how it goes. Your fasting, once again, it is an, an, an activity. And no matter how good, no matter how righteous, if you fast just to fast, you must ask yourself why you're fasting. Now, I'm not talking about the physical aspects of fasting, cleansing your, your body. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, I'm trying to keep it on a spiritual level. If you're fasting just to fast, if you're fasting just because somebody said to fast, if you fast and you don't pray, listen, you must continue to put your faith not in the practice of fasting, but in Jesus Christ and him alone. You have to ask yourself, why are you fasting? What is your purpose? Now, if your purpose in fasting, this is going to be controversial, but listen, if your purpose in fasting is to say, I need deliverance from sin. I have a bad habit. I have bad habits. I have things about me that need change and I'm going to fast them away. No. You do not fast sin away. That's not the purpose of fasting. You cannot fast sin away. No. So the, if you do that, once again, you are placing faith in your fasting. And faith is taken off of Christ and he does not get the glory anymore. The one who gets the glory when the fast is over is you. Because you complete it. And even though you won't pat yourself on the back, literally, you're going to say, I did it. Who's getting the glory? You. Faith must go in Christ. Faith must go in Christ. We cannot put our faith in objects, in things. We cannot put our faith in prayer shawls. We must not place our faith in anything. There is no power in the prayer shawl. Okay? There is no inherent power in a prayer shawl. Let, let's, let's understand this. It's, it's not there. It is a piece, piece of cloth. And Jesus may or may not have had one. The Old Testament prophets may or may not have had one. The Bible doesn't speak of it explicitly. But once again, you cannot place your faith in an object, in a thing. In a thing. Now, when I say object, when I say that your faith is only as good as the object that it's placed on, I'm talking about it must be placed on Jesus. On Jesus. Why? Because it's Jesus who died on the cross for us. Jesus died. Not the prayer shawl. Not anything else. Not anyone else. Jesus died on the cross. He saved me. He delivered me. He keeps me. That's where my faith belongs. That's where it needs to stay. Not in anything else. Not in any activity. If you read your Bible every day, as you should, this 
you you cannot go wrong. You cannot go wrong. When you read your Bible, you gain knowledge, you gain understanding. He speaks to your heart. Uh, he, he, he strengthens you. All, all of these things happen when you read the Bible. You have to. You must read the Bible. But it must not just become an exercise to do. Just to do because I'm supposed to do it. And if I don't do it, you can't beat yourself over the brow and say, I didn't. Do no, no, no. You, you must be careful not to turn righteous, quote, righteous activities Good things, you must be careful not to turn these things into law. Don't turn fasting into a law. Don't turn Bible reading into a law. Don't turn any good biblical activity into a law. You do not even put faith in the, listen carefully, you do not put faith in the act of prayer. Once again, you're putting faith in yourself. You're putting faith in yourself. You do not put faith in the act of prayer. Yes, as you pray, you should have faith. But as you pray, your faith must be in Christ. Not in the act of praying. You must not do that. If you go up to be prayed for, if you go on a prayer line, nothing wrong with a prayer line, if you go on a prayer line to be prayed for by someone and they put hands on you, you do not put faith in in the hand of the person placing their hands on you. You cannot expect anything from that. The man, the individual, has no power to heal you, to save you, to deliver you. He does not have it. Whatever power he has, it's from the Lord. He has no power in that hand unless the Lord uses him or her. So your faith, once again, has to be in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. That's where your faith belongs. Completely and absolutely. So he is already here in verse number five. He is assuming that you have your faith right. And we have to have our faith right. We have to put our faith in Christ. And let me add this little caveat to when I say in Christ. We have to put our faith in Christ and the cross. Now, when I say and the cross, I'm not separating Christ from the cross. Christ cannot be separated from the cross. Now, that doesn't mean that he's still on the cross. Of course, Christ is not still on the cross. He conquered death. Jesus is alive. But what he did at the cross is what makes everything that we do possible. What was accomplished there. What he did there makes everything powerful that we do because of Christ. So what does what does actually it mean? What does it mean? What does the death of Christ mean for the church? Now, last week we went into the book of Ephesians. We went into the book of Ephesians for a few minutes to talk about the different blessings that have come as a result of Christ dying on the cross. But if you want to sort of encapsulate it and I'll give you four things I'll give you four things uh, that happened when Christ died on the cross four four quick things no, not quick things but four things that happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross what they mean to us it meant number one death to the old self death to the old self you go to the book of Romans Romans chapter 6 Romans chapter 6 and verse number 6. Romans 6 and 6. It says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. In other words, when Jesus died, I died. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That word sin. Throughout the Bible, rather throughout this book of, of Romans, until we get to the chapter, verse number 15, I believe, every time you see the word sin, it's talking about the sin nature. It's talking about the sin nature. So it should read, verse 6 should read, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of the sin nature 
might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve the sin nature. That's how it should read. That's how it should read. That's how it reads in the original languages. It's talking about the sin nature. Not talking about acts of sin, things that you do that are sinful. It's talking about the sin nature. And when we, when Jesus died on the cross, it meant death to the old life. The sin nature now is subdued. Not the sin nature is not dead. The sin nature is not dead, but we become dead to the sin nature. Understand, we become dead to the sin nature. Not the other way around. Uh, so our old man is crucified. Here's what it says in First Peter. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24. It says... Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Talking about the cross. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. Now this, this verse is talking about dead to sins. Talking about actual committing of things that are sinful. But he says we are dead to those things now because he bare our sins in his own body. He bore our sins in his own body. In other words, he paid the price. He took the penalty. He sacrificed himself on our behalf. We should have died and not he himself. Okay? Because we are saved by his stripes. In other words, as he was punished, as he was whipped, as he was beating, he was enduring the punishment that we should have taken ourselves. And when he died, he was dying our death. Our sins were placed upon him, and he died. So, and we died, we just read in Romans chapter 6, when, we, when he died, we also were crucified with him. That's a startling truth. That's a startling uh, a truth. That when he died on the cross, we died also. Romans goes on to say that when he rose again, we also rose with him. So this is a glorious, glorious truth. So it's not only death to the old life. The second thing, the second thing that it means, uh, Christ dying on the cross. When we say, put your faith in Christ and the cross. Uh, we mean the fact that it also means death to self. Go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 2. Familiar portion of scripture. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Here it goes again. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Once again, bringing up the fact from Romans that when he died, we died. I am crucified with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I live. And I'm not still dead. This doesn't mean, the fact that I was crucified with Christ doesn't mean that I'm still dead. Because he's not still dead. He is alive. Yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live this life by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, faith in what he accomplished at the cross. That's where my faith belongs. Nowhere else. My faith must be there. Who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the only way I can be saved. When I got saved, once again, it, it, it bears repeating. Anytime an individual gets saved, truly saved, truly saved, when a person gets saved, it's because they have put their faith in Christ. It means that they have believed 
in what Jesus did for them on the cross. They don't understand all the ramifications. They don't get, they haven't gotten all theological. Uh, they don't know it from A to Z, but they have come to the spiritual understanding that Christ died for them. I came, when I got saved, I came to an understanding without understanding anything much, but I came to the realization that Jesus Christ died for me. That Jesus Christ died for my sin. And that fact prompted me to go up to the altar and lay myself there and say, help me God. Because I didn't know what else to say. But I understood that Jesus died for me. I believed it. I had been listening to it for at least a year and not really acting upon it. Fighting it until I could fight it no more. Jesus Christ died for my sin. And I realized I was a sinner. And I understood what was spoken that the wages of sin is death. And so I said, help me God. That's all I knew. And so when you get saved, it's because you placed your faith in Jesus. You have understood on a very basic level that Jesus died for you. And that you are a sinner. You have to acknowledge that you're a sinner. If you don't acknowledge you're a sinner, you can never be saved. I'm not too bad. There are people worse than me. I don't really sin too bad. All of these, if, you, if that's where you are, then you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved. Okay? Jesus came for those who needed a, who were sick. If you're not sick, then you don't need a doctor or a savior. But of course, Jesus came for everyone. But if a person doesn't believe that they need help, they won't receive that help. This is very simple. This is very simple. And so, death to the old life. The cross means death to the old life. The cross means death to self. Next, the cross means death to the flesh. Go to the book of Galatians, chapter number 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 24. Galatians 5 and 24 it says and they who are Christ's who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts your flesh becomes crucified when you are in Christ your flesh This flesh is akin, it's likened to the sin nature. It is not quite the sin nature. Your flesh, that part of you that wants to do what it wants to do, that part of you that wants to be what it wants to be, this is what is now crucified when you are in Christ. Now, all of this, all of the, the, the sinfulness and the sin nature, it can resurrect. It can come back to life. It can spring forth back to life if you begin to put your trust and your faith back in the doing of things. If you put your trust in the law. Remember, we are no longer under law. We are under grace. Grace. That's where we stand. That's where we are spiritually. But if you're a Christian and you are still living under the law, you are not under grace. You cannot be under grace and under law at the same time. No. You are either under grace or you're under law. You decide. You decide. If you are still counting on the doing of things, to bring you deliverance. If you're still, if you're still uh, accounting on the, the the different things that you do, that you believe that these things will make you righteous, 
then you are still under law. But we are no longer under law. We are under grace. Remember what we read last time. Remember how we read out of the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse number 15. How he nailed these, uh, he nailed the uh, blotting out all of these things. Let me read it again from the book of Colossians, chapter number 2, and verse uh, number 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Remember we talked about the principalities and the powers. We're talking about that's the enemy. That's the devil. That's the enemy's demons. That, that's evil spirits. That's, that's all that the enemy controls in his, in his world, in his, uh, in his realm. He says, having spoiled uh, or snatched away. Okay, snatched away. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show. Jesus made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Okay, so this is what this is what he did. In verse number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's the law. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. It's against us because we could not keep it. We could not do it. We could not keep the law, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Uh, the penalty for not keeping the law, was taken out of the way and nailing it to his cross. So we are no longer debtors to the flesh. We are no longer debtors to the law. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. It is finished. He opened up a new chapter. The veil in the temple was split in two. We can now come boldly to the throne of grace to receive to receive uh, mercy and grace and, and help in times of need. And we don't need to rely upon the law. We are no longer law keepers in that sense. We are now under grace. Thank God for his grace. Now the fourth thing that we are, uh, that the cross means to us who are in the church. Let, let's go over those first three that we said. We said that the cross means uh, death to the old life from Romans chapter 6 and 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 24. We said that uh, the cross uh, means death to self from uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless uh, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Uh, we said third, that the cross means death to the flesh. Galatians 5 and verse Number 24, they who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And finally, the cross means death to the world. Death to the world. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. And I unto the world. So I have, I no longer have a connection to the world. He says that the world is crucified to me and I'm crucified to the world. So the flesh with its affections and lust has been crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the world is crucified to me and I am crucified to the world. All of this happened at the cross when Jesus died on the cross. When he was crucified, I was crucified. When he was crucified, you were also crucified. When he rose again, he also, you also were uh, rose again. When you go back to Romans chapter number six, Romans chapter number six, let's go back there. Romans 6, verse number 5. Verse number 5. Let's start at verse number 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Once again, it's because of the cross. If Jesus did not die, he could not have risen again. Verse number 5. For if we have been planted together with Christ... 
in the likeness of his death. In the likeness of his death. In other words, when he died, we died. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So when he arose again, we arose again. When he rose again, we rose again. We have to bless God and thank God for what he did for us on the cross. That's where our faith goes. And before you can, before you can grow properly, properly, notice what I said, before you can grow properly in Christ, you have to have the right kind of faith. The right kind of faith. The right kind of the right kind of faith is faith that is in Jesus. Nowhere else. Faith has to be in Jesus. There's no other way to put there's no other way to get around it. Your faith, if your faith is not in Jesus, that means your faith is in something else. You cannot have your faith in Jesus and something else. It's not Jesus plus something else. It has to be squarely and solely, completely. In Jesus. And trust me, we all we all tend to gravitate toward the doing of things. We all gravitate toward the doing of things. When things get bogged down, we we we, we gotta do more. We gotta try harder. We gotta pray harder. We have to go to church more. We have to do everything a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Faith has to be in Christ and what he has already accomplished on the cross. That's where faith belongs. And here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5, he is assuming that you have your faith in the right place. Just add to your faith. Add to your faith. Let me just make one more last statement before we close out tonight. And we made this statement abundantly last week, but I want to I want to repeat it once again. Do not put your faith in your faith. Okay? Don't put faith in faith. We're never told the Bible doesn't tell us to put faith in faith. No. No. Faith in Christ and what he accomplished at the cross. That's what your faith is. Every day. Every moment. That's where our faith needs to stay. And once again, it's going to be a struggle because the enemy is going to always be there to try and remind you that there's something more that you have to do. And you got to put your faith here. you got to put your faith there. you got to put your faith in this person and that person, this thing and that thing. Things are not working out for you. You got to do harder. You got to try harder. You got to do more and more and more and more and more. When is more? How do you know you've done enough? If you have to do more. If you have to read your Bible more, how much more do you have to read your Bible? If you have to pray harder, how much harder do you have to pray? If you have to fast for 10 days, how do you know you don't have to fast for 20 or 30 or 40 days? How, how, how much do you have to fast? How much do you have to pray? How much do you have to read? Once again, if you do these things religiously, it becomes religion and it becomes law. And you become a law keeper and not one who is under grace anymore. You must keep your faith. Keep your eyes. Keep your focus on Jesus. Your faith is only as good as the object that it is placed on. Learn that. It makes a whole lot of sense. Your faith is only as good as the object that it is placed upon. We're not calling Jesus an object. We're not calling the cross an object because we're not talking about we're not talking about we're not talking about the wooden we're not talking about this wooden emblem that the cross is on. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about the cross and what happened at the cross. That's what we mean by the cross. So we must make sure that we do this. Keep our eyes, our focus. On Jesus. Once you have your faith right, then you can begin to add these different things to your Christian life. The virtue, as we talk, we're going to talk about the virtue and the knowledge and the 
self-control and all these other things. But, but you have to, you have to keep your faith. You have to keep your faith in Christ and you have to keep your faith in Christ alone. Alone. Amen? Well, amen. Amen. We're going to end. We're going to end our study right here. And we want to bless the Lord once again. Uh, we come to you these Wednesday nights with a Bible study that we believe that the Lord has given us. Talking about spiritual growth for these last several months. Uh, starting the new year, it's necessary that we become involved in uh growing uh, in the Lord. So we must make sure that we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must make sure that we do this. Get yourself hooked up. Get yourself aligned with the Word of God. Uh, get yourself into a good Bible study. Uh, join us here on Wednesday nights. I'm quite sure you will learn some things that you may not have uh, known uh, before. Uh, so you must, must make sure of this. Amen. So once again, we are here. You can go to our Facebook page. You can go to uh, our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, you can go to Spreaker.com. If you'd like to listen to any of these Bible studies, once again, you can go directly there right after this uh, Right after this is over. It will be streaming. It will not be streaming there. We're streaming now. But it will be available to listen to almost immediately after we are done here. Uh, but once again, make yourself uh, make yourself available to the Lord. He has many things that he wants to teach. He has many things that he wants to show you. And we pray that we will be, have a part in bringing you to the places where you need to be in the Lord. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and we'll see you next time for the Wednesday night Cutting It Right Bible study. May God bless you. <laughs>